Hello and welcome to Naval Horizons. I'm Samina Mondal, a public affairs intern with the US Naval Research Laboratory, a part of the Naval Research Enterprise. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to be joined with Ms. Amanda Clark, who is the head of Autonomous Weapons and Robotic Systems Branch of the Naval Surface Worker Center, Dahlgren Division. Thank you so much for joining us, Amanda. Hi, thanks, Samina. Now, from my understanding, you're a woman of many talents when it comes to STEM and STEM excellence in particular. Could you please start us off with a bit of a discussion and introduction to yourself on your role within the US Navy and who you are? Okay, yeah, um, certainly. I would say that uh, my role within the Navy has changed significantly. I've been with Naval Service Warfare Center Dahlgren for about 11 years. Um, my, in, my educational background is entirely in biology and microbiology. Um, I, I have a master's in both medical microbiology and um, biodefense. Um, but as you said, I am now the head of the um, autonomy weapons and robotic systems branch. So those two things are not related in the least, but they, other than they're still STEM. So <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, that's incredible. So because you didn't have a necessarily conventional path than maybe what you had initially expected, what more or what exactly in college did you envision yourself doing compared to what you are doing today? So I actually envisioned myself in the medical field. Um, and so that morphed a little bit as I went through because I took the opportunity, which I think is very important when you're coming through your education career to volunteer and really immerse yourself in the field that you're in one way or another that you're trying to pursue. And so I did that and I changed course over time. And that's how I learned that I really liked microbiology specifically in the, in the bio field and um, started to pursue that as a profession. So moving into almost this realm of understanding your background in education, did you have any sort of affiliation or connection to the Department of Defense or Department of Navy? I actually did not. Um, other than having a couple of family members that served in the Navy, I did not have a career path directly into the Navy. So I started out from college working at the state laboratory um, doing public health um, mainly um, actually food surveillance. So I got to basically pretend, you know, do, do the food investigations, right? If a, if a patient is, has salmonella, what food did it come from? And so that's how I started out. And because of the type of work, the type of technology I was working with at that laboratory, um, I got the attention of somebody, actually a professor that I worked with um, for my master's degree had started working for the Navy and she um, kind of got in touch with me and that's how I ended up here. She, she was working for the Navy and recognized that I had a skill set um, and knowledge of the technology that was needed for a particular project or program here at the time. Was there any sort of pathway that you saw open up almost from the Department of the Navy? Perhaps maybe they supported your education or different sorts of training that you've done? Absolutely. The Navy is big on um, two things, academic achievement. So they actually funded my second master's degree. Um, I was with the bio, I started in the Navy with the biodefense mission. That mission was moved to another warfare center. And so I decided to stay at Dahlgren. Um, I enjoyed working at Dahlgren. So that's what led me on a brand new path to technology I'd never imagined working with. Um, so um since they're so big on academic um, support, they actually funded, you know, funded my second degree. So that is an awesome perk of, of being part of the Navy. The other part is they really value leadership training, um, which is something that I actually um, feel like I is one of my strength areas. And so I take advantage of all kinds of um, opportunities to obtain that leadership training. And it's at all levels. It's at first coming into the Navy, they have leadership training that is for new hires all the way up through, you know, senior executive level training opportunities. So they value training at all levels and leadership at all levels. That's amazing. It's good to hear that you have that sense of support along the way, even when you're 
trying to make sense of your profession. As the autonomous weapons and robotic systems section head, which seems like such a grand field, could you tell us a little bit more about perhaps the specific elements of science and technology that go into your day-to-day work? Yeah, so this group is pretty amazing. So they're kind of at the intersection of autonomy, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, they're taking that, I mean, it's it's a big field in industry right now. And um, they're essentially taking what's being done in industry and applying it to, to military type application, applications that are specific to the Navy. Um, and actually working across the Marine Corps and Army and lots of different services, but um, they, they're they taking existing like optical and video feeds and other sensor information and integrating that um, to make pairing, uh, to pair platforms, whether they're robotic platforms or um, current platforms, like current Navy ships. Um, and they're pairing um, the platforms using the sensors and video feed and any information they can gather and writing software that um, provides information to better assist um, the different types of engagement systems. So including, and that's a wide variety of things, including the new fields of laser, lasers and electromagnetic um, and high microwave um, systems, as well as, you know, your traditional like missiles and stuff like that. Um, so that's a big part of what they do. And essentially it's, you know, developing machine and robotic human aids to, um, help assist us, um, our men and women in uniform do their job. So how would you say that your field of autonomous weapons and robotic systems directly makes that impact on the Department of the Navy? Particularly in our field, again, it's, it's autonomy and and weapon systems. So we're trying to make a very specific niche in this autonomy world. And it's not, and it's trying to help protect our men and women in uniform by extending their range, extend, extending their physical range. Robots, they don't need um, to sleep. They, they can always stay alert. Um, you can program them to see, um, to look over the horizon for at the horizon for very long periods of time without needing a case of monster energy drinks to do it. Um, so it's helping our, you, you know, our men and women see farther, um, detect things faster, right? They, and um, our computer vision and machine learning that we're doing is you, you can see a small quadcopter coming at you, you know, farther away than maybe a human eye could detect. And so that helps us again, engage faster, right? And so, and we can do all of that from a remote location. So we're keeping our, we're protecting our people and helping them defend um, the ship and and the nation really. So I think it's, it's very important. It's kind of the way that we're, you know, that the field is changing, that the Navy is changing. They're starting to, um, use more technology to their advantages. So, so Top Gun is a big thing right now. You know, like everybody's raving about the movie and, and Admiral Kane in there. He's like, unmanned systems are the way of the future. And that was a very unpopular opinion in that movie. But it it is actually the truth. Like that is the direction that the Navy is going. And it's all, you know, machines and robots, they're expendable. And so putting them on the forefront, you know, collecting surveillance and doing, you know, some of that work ahead of our personnel is is a much better situation to be in. And that's very powerful. So in terms of short and long-term goals, thinking about your department and the idea of unmanned systems, where do you see it, it advancing? In what terms and maybe even on greater scales? It is the state of the art, right? Industry is doing this every day. Um, you know, but they're doing it for specific applications. Um, and we're trying to adapt that to, to military applications, right? A robot that you need in the field to deliver supplies to a remote location, um, it needs to know that tall grass is not the same as a brick wall, right? Tesla's not really looking at that for self-driving cars, <laughs> right? But the military needs to, right? The robot, that robot that has essential supplies on it needs to know it can drive through the grass. and needs to know we can navigate around a ditch. Um, we're not really training our commercial cars to do those kinds of things. So 
that's what I mean by direct military application of sort of cutting edge technology that industry is doing. We're not recreating the wheel, we're repurposing it to our applications that matter for the Navy. Um, we also are trying to be more specific, right? The, the self-driving car needs to identify, oh, there's a, there's a human there on the sidewalk that wants to cross the street. We need to slow down. Um, you know, that's a, that's a stop sign. But again, in the field, you've got completely different obstacles to navigate around. Um, it would be useful for us to be able to know, is that not just a vehicle? Is it a tank? Is it a Humvee? So doing more classification beyond, you know, what industry is currently doing. So that's how we're um, kind of staying on the state of the art um, and again, applying it to, to the Navy you know, building trust and ensuring safety with these types of systems. Like, so a big part is if we're fielding these things, um, the people using them have to trust them, right? They have to know that they're going to do what we expect them to do. And it's not like, you know, having another um, soldier there to say, okay, do you have my back? Like they have to trust this machine to do what it's designed to do. And so part of that is um, we do that through simulation training. So I have a whole group of people that are um, essentially hacking a video game and tr wow. using that to train the robots, right? Like you can put, take this first person viewpoint video game and load in a specific um, scenario or, um, for us, we're doing demonstrations at particular um, test sites, and we can put that in. And the robot doesn't know the difference of is it in a simulated environment or a real environment. And so that's how we can start to build trust in the system, right? If we can um, play video games with the robot and it performs well, then we can take it out to the, to the field and do, do similar things. And so we have a whole crew of people kind of doing that, playing video games for <laughs> simulations <laughs> to help advance the technology faster. How can students, whether they be in high school or college, find their way to get involved in hands-on experience? I know specifically um, Dahlgren as a worker center sponsors a lot of STEM events through all of the local high schools and um, partners with universities. So they are um, actively engaged in those um, initiatives. And so the, uh, there's STEM camps, there's scientists and engineers from the Warfare Center that go to the schools on a regular basis um, and do the robotics um, clubs and stuff like that. So I, I do, I can't speak for, you know, the Navy as a whole, whole on the specific events, but, at, you know, just evidence by what Dahlgren prioritizes and what we um, provide um, through our um, academic engagement office, that there's a lot of opportunity out there. You just kind of got to look for it. And then they do partner with local high schools and even middle schools, um, you know, start them as young as possible. Um, and definitely partner with universities on, on STEM events. So I, I think there's a lot of good attention on STEM and the Navy um, definitely supports that in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And just based on your expertise in the field and thinking about the amount of years that you've devoted towards learning and growing as a civilian worker, could you provide us with a piece of information that you would give your younger self or perhaps the students that are out there that want to take part in the STEM workforce, but aren't quite sure where they belong yet. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you keep an open mind, right? Like, I, again, you don't have to be a science, uh, a math major or a physics major to be successful in STEM, like there, or, or to even be successful in a Navy career. There's opportunities for um, lots of different types of people and you can apply where whatever your strengths are um, to a lot of different areas right if you're a creative type or a strategic a visionary type there's there's lots of room for you here if you're a technical details I just want to you know pound out some code like there's definitely you know opportunities and, and places for you here as well so it's I think it's important not to pigeonhole yourself and really 
get out there and learn and develop and talk to people and volunteer and seek out events that would give you the experiences that you're that you're looking for. Well, thank you so much, Amanda, for this amazing conversation. I really have no doubt that you are an inspiration, not only within your field, but to those like-minded students that we have watching here today that'll make up the future of the STEM workforce. So we appreciate it. All right, thank you. I appreciate um, the opportunity.